Welcome everyone to Asian Pacific Voices Radio, where you will find stimulating conversations that explore diverse topics and stories that affect and impact our communities. I'm your host, Sasha Fu. Our guest today is someone very special. She is a fierce competitor, mentor, teacher, and coach. Kelly Inouye Perez is the head softball coach at UCLA. She's held that title for almost 18 years. Her list of achievements is a pretty lengthy and impressive one. Under her leadership, she led the Bruins to NCAA championships twice in 2019 and 2010, respectively. And for those in the know, Coach Kelly has taken her women's teams to four regular season Pac-12 titles. Coach Kelly has been a part of the Bruin community for 36 years, starting first as a standout player while she was enrolled as a student at UCLA, then becoming an assistant coach and now steering the university's softball program as head coach. I can say, probably safely say, that Coach Kelly Inouye Perez is one of the most prominent Asian American coaches in college athletics. So with that said, we'd like to welcome Coach Kelly today. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks for having me. We're really pleased to have you join our conversation today. Well, let's start out a little bit by learning more about you. I know you um, were born and bred in Southern California. You're of Japanese ancestry. Tell us a little bit more about your family and how you got involved in playing softball and competitive sports in general. First and foremost, I um, always like to credit my mom and dad. Uh, my mom it was born and raised on the Big Island of Hawaii in a small town of Hilo. And my dad um, from Wailuku, Maui, and both of them decided to go to college um, over here in the mainland in a, in a small school in Oregon, Pacific University. Um, and with that move, um, found each other, moved down to Los Angeles here in Southern California. My dad worked in the city of Los Angeles, downtown LA and City Hall for many years. But uh, a big part of that was to create opportunity, um, you know, for us. So there there was, um, I was born and raised here in Southern California and started sports just with my parents really pushing us, you know, having us try everything from mm. sports to music, to dance, to, you know, arts, um, just a lot of things. And I found out what I was good at, what I wasn't good at. But for some reason, when I got out there on the softball field at about 10 years old, I, I, you know, everything seemed to just flow. I was naturally very shy, um, very, very, very shy child and loved to just stay home with my mom, felt comfort, even though I had two sisters that were very outgoing. Um, it wasn't until I found softball with all the activities that I did that I looked forward to running out there and just playing. And um, so I really credit my parents. You know, they created an opportunity. They pushed me to try a lot of things. And I and and with it kind of had me come out of my comfort zone. And, and it's just, gosh, the rest is history of the decisions and the opportunities that I've had to be able to get where I am today. So, you know, my mom and dad, that's what it's all about. I love that you credit your mom and dad for your success. I was going to ask you a little bit about um, Asian Americans in sports. And we think of prominent Asian American athletes, uh, especially at the professional level. I think of ice skating. I think of golf, um, maybe tennis a little bit. They're all individual sports. Do you think there's any sort of cultural bias or stereotypes about what is proper to play, uh, what sports are proper to play, especially in Asian families? Is there maybe a bias towards individual sports versus competitive team sports? Because I haven't played individual sports, I wouldn't really know. Um, but I can tell you all, all I can say is how I've been raised. And then also the one thing that I could say is, you know, really the community that you live in um, mm -hmm. can really dictate a lot. For example, both my sisters, um, when we were, we lived first in the city of Torrance, predominantly Asian community. And there were leagues, um, like there was a league called Seo that were Japanese only. So you had to be either, you know, Japanese, I think it was like 50%, at least 50% Japanese to even play in the league. So mm -hmm. it was on the flip side that, you know, it was an opportunity for the Japanese community only, but I would only see that as an opportunity for like basketball where height was a big, you know, deciding factor on who could be great. And they allowed for it to be more of a Japanese league where height wasn't maybe the predominant, you know, aspect of, of how you could be an athlete. Um, so I, I saw it in that form that you had the ability to bring people together that had common characteristics to be able to be successful and enjoy sports. 
But to get back to your question about team sports versus individual, I was never put in a position to be pushed towards, I'll just say stereotypically tennis has a lot of Asians or golf has a lot of Asians, you know, whatever sports individually that, but that potentially could go down that path of being more predominant with, um, with Asians. Um, for me, I can definitely say growing up that when I played softball and a lot of sports, there were a lot, there weren't a lot of people that looked like me. And I had very few experiences where, um, I had no, no experiences. I had one experience. I can say this. I was recruited to play for a team and they said, you would be the only one that's not blonde on this team. It wasn't as if I was going to not be allowed to play. They wanted to let me know that everybody may not look like me. I, you know, it was irrelevant for me. I wanted to be able to throw it and hit it um, the way our, the sport required without worrying about girls' hair color or what they look like. So um, I think team is, is unique. You know, in all sports, there are stereotypically and I th- certain types of people that may play. And most of them are physical attributes as you get to the higher levels. I think at the lower levels, it's more community based. There may be a comfort to be able to be with people that are more like you, so to speak. But I think as you get to the higher levels, you're really able to, to distinguish and separate out based on your skill. And it's no longer what you look like. I think that is ideally, this is a uh, colorblind or, or people accept each other and we're tolerant. Although, you know, we've been hearing at some, in some professional sports that some, uh, athletes of color have been harassed. I'm thinking of uh, some some soccer players of color have complained that they've been harassed by fans in some of the matches that they've played in Europe, and which is really unfortunate. I think it really comes down to um, culturally, like you know, th- there's it, it depends on the community that you're in, and you know, in any area of the world that you go to, there's going to be a fan base, and fans have the ability to choose who they want to cheer for or against. And that's part of athletics that we all understand. You know, I have had a chance to go play internationally in Peru. And you would think in Peru, there would be a Hispanic culture. You know, you would think if I would think of Peruvian, I would stereotypically think dark skin, Hispanic. I don't know. That's just what I would assume. Little did I know when I went to Japan for USA, there were, there was a complete Japanese, um, Peruvian culture that spoke Spanish and were green eyed. I think what you're hearing is once again, I simply attribute that not necessarily to discrimination or, or any type of racial bias, or it's about fans have a choice in, in their certain, and, and that's where, so for me in athletics, whether I'm Japanese or I'm a female or I'm a softball player, there are people that are support me and there's people that are against, against it. And I literally teach our girls and myself to block all that out because there's always going to be that. There's always going to be people that may discriminate or not like you for whatever their reasons are, but there's always also those that, that support you. I don't have really great examples of team individual regarding regarding the whole, you know, Asian um, American bias, so to speak. Coach Kelly, I'm going to call you Coach Kelly for the duration of this interview. Uh, you've probably seen the perception of women in sports change over the 36 years that you've been involved with the softball program at UCLA. Can you share some of your observations or thoughts on that? First and foremost, I mean, we just celebrated the 50th um, anniversary of Title IX um, and really being able to have the opportunity for female in sports to be able to do what we're doing. Um, and I always like to be able to stop and, and say and give thanks to those that walked before us, that fought, had a voice and created this opportunity um, for me to be able to have a profession, do something that I'm passionate about and get paid for it as a female. Um, so during, during this time, you know, from salaries to budgets to, you know, being on, uh, televised on TV to, um, just truly being able to actually have a platform to be able to have a voice as a female. Um, you know, that's the biggest part of my job now is being, you know, no longer back in the day was just about being able to stand out and win in sports. In this generation, I really am in a position to be able to grow and empower females because the opportunity is there to be able to be a leader, to be able to do something you're passionate about and be able to be valued, um, you know, to be able to lead as a female. It is a reality. You know, there are people that are looking for that, your ability to talk, walk and act, to be able to lead and be a part of a team and make an organization better is is the opportunity is there. So I think 36 years later, 
I think I really went from just seeing the world as a, as a student athlete to now as a coach, my biggest job is not just winning in sports, but really growing and developing women because we have a chance to get out there and lead. If you bring value and you can articulate it and get people to understand why you could make their organization, family, business, team better. Um, so I love that. I love that we're really able to take advantage of opportunities that were created for us in sports 50 years ago with Title IX. I want to, since you're talking about diversity, uh, we're talking about diversity too in this podcast, because after all, it's called Asian Pacific Voices. <laughs> I want to ask you a little bit about um, being an Asian American in a coaching role. I think the traditional idea of coaching, I mean, we used to think of coaches as, you know, white men calling the shots from the sidelines. Is being an Asian American, especially an Asian American woman, a woman of color, is that somewhat of a still an unusual thing in the realm of college sports? You know, um, yes, it is. I'm a minority for sure. Being a Asian American female coach in a male dominated profession. Absolutely. Um, and I love it. I love it because there are so many young girls and so many coaches that I have been able to mentor and, and model for um, in so many different capacities. First and foremost, um, being able to work with and so to speak across the field with males and not being intimidated by them. You know, being able to be a, an Asian American um, and being able to be a role model for all those little girls. And, you know, I, I have players on my team that have, um, you know, Pacific Island descent that have literally said, we've grown up watching you on TV and, and being able to say that we could do that. You know, and one of my biggest superstars right now, Megan Faramo, beautiful, uh, beautiful Pacific Islander, just, just amazing athlete. Um, that is her biggest her biggest thing is, coach, I want to be able to show all the girls that look like me that they can do what I'm doing. So she was an MVP and all American. She's with Team USA. Um, her goal is to be an Olympian for, for softball, but to be able to realize that there were, there, there might have not been that push at home prior to, and that she could be a role model that you could be on TV and you could really excel and get your education paid for. That's what we love to do is being able to be role models to all those little girls and have a platform on TV where people look and say, Oh my gosh, I could do that too. I'm also proud that I'm a mentor for so many different coaches that I also am married and I have two kids and I'm in a leadership role. It can be the breadwinner in my family and have a wonderful husband. But there are a lot of female coaches that call and say, I didn't think I could have a family and also mm -hmm. be in this coaching profession. Because if you look, stereotypically coaches are very focused on just coaching, you know, and, and I believe you can do it all. So I like to be a role model that you can do it all, especially when you think about the Asian community, you know, <laughs> it may not be, you know, the goal for, for the Asian community to say, you can be a leader, you can be a mother and a wife and be in a job that travels year round and be in this position. So I'm not here to say it's the only path. I'm just saying there's opportunities to be able to do it all. Well said. We talked about, you know, the having Asian, an Asian American woman like yourself in the coaching position. What about your players? How do you recruit players? And uh, is ha creating a diverse team something that's of importance to you? First and foremost, I'm very really fortunate. I feel I love my job because I feel like I can really go after the top 1% in, in what I'm looking for. And that's a Definitely, there's obviously a softball skill that you need to be able to bring to the table to help us win. But I also am at a school like UCLA where there's an academic background um, that you really take pride in what that degree can do for you. And then obviously being in the in a in a community like LA, LA is a very diverse culture, community. You know, we're a melting pot. We have people from all over the world and we take pride in that. So I invite people to be able to come to UCLA understanding that that's what it's about. It's family, the people that you surround yourself with, and everybody looks different. We all come from different parts of the world. What you do at the dinner table may be different than what I do, but we all learn to come together to be able to you know, accomplish a common goal. But it's the people. Everyone's thriving and, and, and really uh, has put excellence at the top you know, success. That's what we're here for. School is, is um, 
why I love my job because that part of it is what I really recruit are girls that like to learn, that like to compete in the classroom, not just on the softball field. Um, so with that, I there is an awareness. There's definitely people that LA seems big and and diverse and and mm -hmm. scary. Not everyone's like me, but I've had great success in being able to recruit girls from different parts of the country and the world to be able to come with the excitement of being able to be submersed in, in a diverse culture. And my coaching staff is very diverse. Our players are very, very diverse. The, the community is very diverse. So I'm looking for people that love to learn, that love to learn about different cultures and different people. And I always tell them they'll be ahead of the game when they leave because they'll simply, not because you want to be just different, but you'll have the ability to communicate and engage in conversations with people that aren't like you. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to be more intelligent. That allows you to actually have a voice and engage in, in a conversation. And it's to learn. So I, I'm, I, I love my job because I'm surrounded by girls that they thrive in that. They thrive getting to know different people, different cultures, different backgrounds, perspectives. We're all different in how we think, but we come together as a team to figure out how to succeed. And that's very, very powerful. It's, it's empowering to, to all of them. And they're more well-rounded to go out in the real world. It's very powerful and empowering to know that we can teach each other. I can teach you, you Absolutely. can teach me, and, and these girls young women are teaching each other. So that's powerful. And I'm Absolutely. sure when you see instances of that on the field and also in their lives off the field, you must feel really great about that. I'm curious about uh, your thoughts or maybe um, how this affected the university community when uh, there was a recent Supreme Court decision that said race could not be a factor in consideration for admissions. Now in California, I know the public schools have not used race as an admission criteria. That's not part of the state policy among the schools here in California. But do you have any particular thoughts about that or in places, maybe not California, where students of color have a much more narrow portal for entry into higher education? Do you think that this ruling might be a little bit, uh, well, maybe harmful in some ways that we haven't anticipated? Um, I will simply say that it's factual, right? That there, there are, um, it's factual in that there are different opportunities for everyone. And I think college is, is an opportunity to pursue higher level education. And there are places in to be able to be successful and be in an environment that's going to help you learn and grow, there may be requirements and things that you have to go through um, to be able to get what you want. You can't control everything. There's going to be people that are going to decide. There's going to be universities and cultures and areas and businesses that are going to decide what they want. And you don't, you know, there, the opportunity thing is there. It may not be at every level that people are as open minded to be able to look at what you can bring, regardless of what you look what you look like or where you're from, but really be able to highlight your skill and what it is that you can bring to be able to help an organization, a team, a family be more successful. So I'm get I I always say yes, go for your dreams, but also it's important that you surround yourself with people that support you. You don't want to put yourself in a position ever to be to feel like you're discriminated against and or you're, you're being held back because of any outside things that may be out of your control, your hair color, your eye color, what you look like, your background, your taste in food and how you dress, all of those things. So, I'm, you know, I'm not really answering your question directly. I say opportunity is something that we're celebrating that there's more and more of. You know, we, we have even engaged in being able to play schools like, you know, the historical black colleges to be able to understand that they have been put in a position um, to really not be able to afford, not be able to prepare, not be able to be a part of, of collegiate athletics, speaking to my world. I think the Asian community has done a wonderful job of really focusing on making school a priority and creating the opportunity for their children to be able to go to college. So I think everybody has their um, potential limitations. I was just wondering if it was a topic of conversation among you and your colleagues in the university community, not just you, but maybe other coaches at UCLA. I think, I think for UCLA, UCLA, we have more applications to UCLA than any other school in the country. It's a fact. So we're going after the top, you know, 1%, you know, valedictorians and are getting turned down from UCLA. And, and there is, 
it's a it's a it's a committee based decision that's really focusing on the best that can come and represent the university and 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 take pride in in that UCLA degree. Um, there are limitations, you know, we can't, we, we have certain percentages of people that can or cannot come in when it comes to athletics. We're not limited. I don't have to say I have to have this many white people and this many black and this many Asian and this many native American, whatever it is, I have no limitations when it comes to that. I know for us, it's about your academic body of work combined with your athletic skill that is going to allow um, for you to be a part of UCLA and UCLA athletics. But there is a committee based decision that high academic standards, high athletic standards, and then ultimately as coaches, our goal is to be able to make sure that you're well rounded, that you would thrive in the LA diverse community. So all of those things have to be checked off for you, for UCLA to be, for you to be what we call the top 1%. Um, and yeah, UCLA athletics is very unique. There are places that you can play high level sports. There's places that you can have high level academics, but to be able to have both academics, athletics, and a very diverse community, we are going after a certain high level individual that can, like I said, it's not survive. It's we want them to thrive in the LA community. Um, so I, I like that it's committee based, that it's overall body of work. It's not just numbers or it's not just your skill on the, the athletic field but it's an overall body of, on how you represent UCLA. And we have the ability to kind of filter through and get the elite to be able to come and represent. No, I, it's, it's, this is interesting. You say it's a committee. And so you don't put the emphasis solely on one's athletic performance or solely on one's uh, college uh, board scores or GPA. It has to be a combination of both that makes a candidate a good candidate to study at UCLA. So I think that's just a really well-rounded, holistic approach. I wanted to bring the conversation into the area of how do you uh, cultivate the talent to get to the college level? And we were talking about something called uh, club um, teams, right? And you said that you got your first taste of what it was like to really compete at a high level when you were in a teenager and you were doing something called uh, club teams for those people who don't know what that means. Can you explain what that is and why is that so important to the development of a student athlete? Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, going back to my start, I started when I was 10 year old, 10 years old playing in the community in rec ball in what we called Bobby Sox. So that's really community based people in your, in your neighborhood that you just come together and the whole point is to fall in love with the sport um, and you, and you, you should try a lot. And then from there, I was fortunate to be selected to a travel or a club team that traveled the country and the world to be able to compete at a higher level, meaning those people could potentially pay to be surrounded by players that are more competitive or want to travel and play at a higher level. So, you know, that's not for everyone. There's rec play for the love of the game in your community. And then there's travel where you're going to create opportunities and be a little more focused and a little more committed to your training. Um, I was fortunate to be a part of that at a very long age, young age where I was um, invited or recruited to play travel. Now, back in the day over, gosh, over 40 years ago, um, that's scary. But over 40 years ago, I was fortunate to be a part of the top organization where I didn't have to pay fees or associations, where in this day and age, it has become very difficult. It's challenging in that because the travel organization is traveling around the country and competing. The college coaches at all levels, division one, two, three, and JC and NAIA are recruiting from those travel organizations. So we go to tournaments to watch people play, look at their academic resumes, and then from that select athletes and invite them to be a part of your college team. So travel, the parents are really paying a lot of money, investing in lessons, investing in travel to be able to with the hopes and dreams to be exposed, to be able to get that college scholarship or a discount on your college. That's where we are in, in this generation with parents' um, goals of, of hoping to be able to get, um, to get that ask, to get that invite for a, a potential athletic or academic scholarship to play softball um, at the next level. That's what travel ball is about. How much is, does it cost these days to participate in a travel team? Oh, that's a tricky question. You know, it's, it could be anywhere, you know, from $2,000 a year, just for, 
just for, um, you know, your fees. But then on top of it, there's lessons, which could be, you know, $80 an hour to travel hotel and flights. And I mean, we, we literally broke it down and said it could be close to $20,000 a year just to be able to play travel ball, which we could say, we might as well save that money and pay for your college. But there's a very, comp- there's also something to be said to be surrounded by higher level athletes and competing and then playing for national championships on a stage. Like there's, there's an experience, there's a team experience, there's traveling the country, there's competing, there's training. There's all of those things that travel ball can bring that have, that are also great experiences as well. For myself, I got to travel around the country. I got to travel around the world with my travel team and win national championships, which really helps promote that competitive excellence. And then I also was, it was all within a family atmosphere, my best friends, all the girls in my wedding and you know, my best friends to this day were in that travel experience because we trained so hard and played and traveled and spent so much time together. So there's a camaraderie about travel ball as well. Um, but I, I do believe the financial aspect in this generation is very difficult. It's very difficult. And we are a sport that is very highly equipment intensive, right? Bats and gloves and helmets and spikes. And it's, it's a very difficult sport. So, um, there are organizations that are sponsored and you have opportunities to be a part of those, but, um, if I were to give one shout out, go to camps and clinics and be able to see the universities, meet the coaches, find out about the majors that they have when it comes to college. I think that could be more valuable than just in the, at the travel ball grind. But I think there are pluses to it. And there also are limitations for those that may not be able to excel at the highest level. You'd be better off training and going to camps and clinics and schools that you're interested in that may have a major that you want to pursue. And I have had that story as well, where we've recruited girls from camps and clinics that want to be Bruins, that are, that know that the major that they want to pursue is at UCLA and have been surrounded with us and we believe can bring value to our organization. So how everyone gets to the college that they're at is a different path. There's opportunities in travel. There's opportunities with camps and clinics. There's opportunities for people to apply, to go to a, a college, get in and try out and possibly make the team. Bottom line, that's our thing. You know, you create your own luck, but you've got to figure out the best path for you. I was going to interject here, though. Was there a group or is there a group or foundation that's helping uh, girls who come from families where they don't have the resources to afford the expenses of joining a travel team so they can kind of give those women, a, a young women a boost? I think, you know, once again, it comes back to your communities. You know, there are things, there are opportunities in different communities. One of my, um, one of my former players, um, very successful softball player and and an Olympian and, um, has played professionally, came back to LA and is running, um, what she calls the Natasha Watley Foundation. And what that is, is she has the opportunity to bring, you know, get to provide opportunity for kids in the inner city to be able to, um, play and compete. You know, so therefore we help donate equipment to the foundation and there's our, some of our girls will go coach in the inner cities because the girls don't have the ability to travel or they don't have the equip, the ability to buy the equipment. So yes, there are, there are foundations, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm recently working with another, um, uh, organization in Fuego softball and baseball, and they're really focusing on inner city, um, opportunities. And it's not just for the inner city, but it's just community based where he's trying to create a model to be able to go to different cities, working with, you know, LAPD or the different, um, uh, just different parts of the community to help drive kids to, you know, to opportunities or provide equipment or provide what they call a big league experience. So, and in a more competitive arena than rec ball. So absolutely, there are there are things out there. You definitely have to look in your community, community find what's available. Um, it's not for everyone to play travel. And some people wreck, they want to be a little more competitive. So I believe there are people out there that want to cr- provide the opportunity. It's not there for everyone, which makes it difficult. But I still believe you can, you know, if you really get passionate about what you want to do, you'll find a way to be able to be um to create, to create that opportunity, whether it's in your community or you have to travel a little further, but it's doing a little research on your end and not waiting to be discovered. It's doing just the opposite, like being able to say, I want to go to this, these top five colleges. So how am I going to get from, from where I am now to there and being able to find the best path for you and your family to be able to make that a reality. 
Well, thank you, Coach Kelly Inouye Perez, for sharing the thoughts about your journey and your passion for bringing people together through sport. Uh, it's been delightful to talk to you. Thank you so much. To learn more about uh, Coach Kelly, um, can you tell us how can people keep up with you or your team? You know, I think the best way if you wanted to follow UCLA softball is, you know, our web, our website is uclasoftball.com. And that's an easy way to kind of keep updated with our schedule, our roster, you know, our, our stats and, and, and bios. So you can learn a little bit more about everybody, where they're from, their families, their backgrounds from their high schools and communities and a little bit more about their culture. Um, on social media, we, ha- you know, UCLA softball is on Instagram, while UCLA is on Twitter, UCLA is all over. And I'm very fortunate that we have a sports information director who is very passionate about getting us out there. So we're, we're able to do things like radio, we're doing things with TV, we're doing, we're televised on what we right currently the Pac-12 network and ESPN. Um, but there are, you know, we have the local news that comes to our practice a lot just to be able to interview our girls because we have girls that are playing professionally. We have girls that are playing with USA softball. We have girls that are representing in the Pacific Islander community. Um, but I'm really proud. So I hope that you can follow <laughs> us on social media and learn more about us as people and females. Um, but ultimately, you know, we're in it to win a national championship. So I can say March. Um, our, our season is February through June and the most exciting part of the season is end of May through June and it's all on ESPN. So you can follow us and see us, but ultimately come up to UCLA at Easton stadium. And that's a fun experience. Yes, we'd love to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, in general though, we would love to hear from you, uh, our listeners at, uh, Asian Pacific Voices and uh, hear from you about your suggestions for future guests or topics. Also, be sure to subscribe to our favorite or your favorite podcast platform. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and also our YouTube channel. Asian Pacific Voices Radio is produced by the Asian Culture and Media Alliance, which is a nonprofit that empowers our Asian and Pacific Islander communities with a voice through media arts. And if you would like to support our program, of course, please visit AsianPacificVoicesRadio.com. I'm Sasha Fu. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Please join us next week for another exciting and thought-provoking Asian Pacific Voices radio show. Until then, take care.